Well, welcome everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, my name is Pam Bond. I'm on the board of the Idaho Trails Association. Welcome to tonight's presentation. We have Ana Lucia here to be talking to us about zero waste hiking. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Can you please make sure that during the presentation, your mic is off. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat window. And um, Anna will answer those as we're going along. If I could just get somebody to give me a, a hands up or a thumbs up or a little message that you can see uh, my presentation. We'll go ahead and get started. All right, thanks, Sally. Okay. All right, so before we get started, I'm actually going to um, talk just a little bit about uh, what the Idaho Trails Association is. So we were founded in 2010 and we are here to promote the continued enjoyment of Idaho's hiking trails. And we mainly do this through volunteer trail maintenance projects, um, but we also very much are um, about stewardship tradition, education, and preservation. Stewardship really through helping caretake all of our beloved non-motorized trails in Idaho tradition. Um, we only use traditional uh, trail maintenance tools. We don't use any mechanized tools like chainsaws. As you can see in the picture here, we use crosscut saws, Pulaski's, um, things of that nature, McLeod's, loppers, um, and then education, we love to share information about how people can um, get outdoors in Idaho safely and respectfully to caretake our lands and enjoy all of our amazing trails. And then also just preservation, like preserving the knowledge of trail maintenance, but also helping preserve the trails we have on the ground. So just to give you an idea, we are ramping up for the 2022 season right now. I think our project schedule hits our website like the end of March. Kelly, send me a message if I'm wrong on that. Um, and I think we have like 50 some projects to choose from this year. So we do trail maintenance all the way throughout the entire state. We have our very first Southeast Idaho project this year, um, but we do lots of stuff. Oh, I'm being told our project schedule hits it's the website March 1st. Um, so be on the lookout for that. If you are not an ITA member, um, I at least highly recommend signing up for our newsletter so that you can get informed when that's up. One of the perks of being an ITA member is you get a one month advantage to sign up for projects. And we have some pretty cool projects, projects that involve airplanes or jet boats, um, take you into some really cool places. We do lots of work in our wilderness areas. So if there's someplace cool you've been dying to hang out, um, an ITA trip is a great way to see some of that country. And that one month advantage is really awesome because our trips do tend to fill up fast. But um, if you do see a project that's filled up on our website, still please be sure to get on the wait list because we do have some churn. Um, people will sign up and then can't make it for some reason and then your number will be called. So be sure to get on those wait lists if you see something you really wanna do. But just looking at um, 2021, you can see we had over 400 volunteers on over 40 projects, thousands of hours, hundreds of, you know, thousands of logs cleared from the trail hundreds of miles cleared, do with lots of tread work, making sure that those are good. Um, water bars, lot drainage is one of the big things that can really ruin our trails, but just um, a ton of work last year. And of course this year we'll be revving it up and doing even more. Um, something that I did wanna mention, um, this is a little bit confusing, but the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation actually has a trail supporter program. And this is a voluntary donation-based sticker program where every year you can go out to the Idaho Department of Parks and Rec website or one of the many places that they sell them in town, including like REI, um, if you're here in Boise, REI, um, oh, probably like um, Idaho Mountain Touring and those things. Um, but they're basically helping raise funding for non-motorized trail maintenance. And um, in their first year, they raised 
over $18,000. And some of that money does come back to organizations, volunteer organizations like the Idaho Trails Association. So they haven't released their 2022 sticker yet. I checked in with them this morning, but they will be out soon on their website and in local stores for you to purchase. I believe they're like 15 bucks, but just a really great way to show your support for non-motorized trails. Um, if you're interested, Idaho Trails Association has some swag that we are selling through Wizard Cow Studios. We have these really awesome t-shirts, hike more, worry less, they say, and these really awesome um, hats with these leather logos on them that are, are pretty cool. I think those are 25 bucks a pop. You can find those out at Wizard Cow Studios. And we wanted to make an announcement that we do have a brand new trail program director, Alex. She has been with us for just over a little over a month. Um, so she's drinking from the fire hose, figuring out how we're ramping up for this season. And unfortunately, we said farewell to Clay, but he's going to be out hiking the Continental Divide Trail this year and probably having a great time, but he will sure be missed. Um, just final announcement that um, we do have another trail talk coming up at the end of this month. This will actually be a hybrid where we do an in-person at Last Road Brewing in Boise on February 23rd at 6 p.m. And um, we will also be streaming that via Zoom. Again, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. So if you can't show up at the Boise location, um, we will be broadcasting that out. And um, I will be teaching a uh, kind of a class, a course on, crash course on how to use um, an application called Gaia GPS. This is a great tool that you can use for plotting out all of your adventures, setting up waypoints and routes, and then um, using that on your phone while you're in the back country. All right, so with that final thing, you can find us on all the social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. This video or this presentation is being recorded and it will be put up on our YouTube site um, sometime soon. So um, if you enjoy what you're seeing, please pass it on to people that you know and spread the information around. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you to all of you who have supported Idaho Trails. We did just finish up with our membership drive, but that does not mean you can't become a member right now. So um, we do ask that um, if you wanna get involved with Idaho Trails Association, please become a member or sign up for our newsletter. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and and the reins over to Ana Lucia. She is here today to talk to us about her venture on the Pacific Crest Trail and um, her experience with trying to go zero waste. Welcome, Ana. Hi, Pam. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak tonight and for opening up this space and for everyone joining us today interested in reducing their waste in the backcountry. I am very grateful that you're here. So I'm going to share my screen because I made a little presentation for you guys. And uh, there we go. Is that visible? Okay. So last year, 2021, I through hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and I made it my mission to do it as waste-free as possible. So today my talk is gonna be about why I did it, how I did it, and um, yeah, answer any questions that you guys might have and share some tips on ways that you can reduce your impact in the outdoors as well. So before I tell you about through hiking the PCT without waste, I just want to tell you about who I am so that you understand why I did the PCT the way I did it. Um, I am Mexican, I'm 27 years old, and I grew up hiking with my dad. He's the one that invited me to the backcountry. He showed me how to hike big mountains to enjoy the trail. And this really made me develop a really deep connection with nature. So we would go out camping. He taught me how to read a GPS, how to set up a tent, how to start a fire. So thank you, dad. He made this uh, little hiking uh, freak happen. So um, yeah, when I started growing up and this deep connection towards nature made me really worry about my environmental footprint. And I started reading and learning more about our unsustainable practices as a species. And uh, I became a vegetarian. And then soon after I became vegan. And in 2018, I learned about this global movement called Plastic Free July. And it's basically a challenge where you try to avoid plastic, specifically single-use plastics for a whole month. 
and I did that and I just stuck with it and I started living a zero waste lifestyle. So if you don't know what a zero waste lifestyle is, basically the goal is to significantly reduce what you throw away into landfill. And instead you try to reincorporate that or well, any byproducts of what you consume as much as possible. So the six R's become kind of like your mantra. So we think about reducing, reusing and recycling as the three R's of consumption or ethical consumption. But first of all, you have to rethink what you are, your actions and your purchases and your impact on like during your day-to-day -day life then you refuse and then you reduce, reuse, repair and recycle. So for every action that I, for most actions that I do, I think about how they're gonna impact the planet and what I can do, what's in my power to lessen this impact. I avoid plastics, particularly single use plastics. I buy in bulk, I carry my own containers all the time, like my own cutlery, my water bottle, my own bags. I make my own products as much as possible. I shop secondhand and I compost as much as I can. And this has made me really feel more connected to my environment and my role and power as a consumer because I have realized that even though it seems like my individual actions don't matter, I can see how other people living the same way have it has become this global movement that is pushing larger corporations and governments towards change. Uh, I read this uh, quote by Jane Goodall, who's an ethologist and environmentalist a few years ago, and it really stuck with me. She says, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. And what you do makes a difference. You just have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So when I read this, it just struck me and every time I have to make a decision related to waste I take a step back and I think about this and I try to make the choice that suits me best. So uh, when I learned about the PCT it was about seven years ago now I saw the movie Wild as many of us here I think has and I was really inspired by the trail I really felt like I wanted to do it, I felt called to it. So it just became a matter of when will I do the trail and not a matter of if I was gonna do the trail. So I was obsessing about it year after year, telling everyone that I was gonna hike the PCT. And on 2021, I had the opportunity to apply for my permit and go hike it. So I started researching. For those of you who don't know what the PCT is, I'm just gonna briefly, uh, tell you about it. It's a long trail in the US that goes from the border of Mexico to the border of Canada through California, Oregon, and Washington. It spans over 22,653 miles. It takes around four to six months to hike, and it goes through very different ecosystems like deserts, alpine tundras, old growth forests, volcanic regions, etc. And in order to do this, you have to break your, your hike into stretches like four to seven day stretches and you stop in towns to resupply because you're not going to carry five months worth of food and water in your pack so people that complete a trail like this a long trail are called through hikers through hikers travel the entirety of a long trail in a continuous single year trip and through hikers tend to look for the most lightweight and convenient options for their hikes because it's gonna take them a really long time to complete. So you wanna be as fast and as light as possible. This means that we weigh everything to the ounce and we obsess about our, our gear list. So um, we look for the, the newest gear, the most ultralight gear, and we wanna take the best things possible, but also the least amount of things uh, possible. And as I said, the hike is broken down into four to seven day stretches. And then you go into a town where you Nero or you zero. A Nero is when you hike close to zero miles. So you just hike for a portion of the day and then you go into town and you rest. And a zero day is when you hike zero trail miles. So you just stay in town for the whole day and you rest. And this is when you resupply on your food and then you head back to the trail the day after or the same day. 
here hikers have several options. They can either send their resupplies in boxes to post offices along the trail, and they can also resupply along the way in the different grocery stores or gas stations that they find. Usually smaller towns have very uh, limited food options and there are very few bulk stores along the whole trail. So uh, there's a lot of waste involved in doing this. When I started researching about how to do my own hike, uh, I had to look at what gear I had to buy, how I could lower my base weight and also plan a vegan food resupply, which was an added challenge. And I saw that there was so much plastic involved. So having lived a zero waste lifestyle for almost three years up to that point, it made me really nervous to think that if I wanted to hike the PCT, I would have to use all this plastic and produce all this waste. And I just kept researching for vegan resupplies and I found more and more waste, more and more waste and more and more waste. And it really, it made me really nervous and it made me question if I really wanted to hike the PCT because I kind of felt like I would be realizing a dream, a six year long dream, but I would be renouncing my values. So I got to thinking and I started researching where I could reduce my waste, but I couldn't find any information on longer hikes. I did find some blog posts about zero waste backpacking, but usually that tended towards uh, weekend trips or even just a day hike where people are using heavier uh, containers to carry their food in order to avoid single-use plastics, or they were dehydrating their own food, but then they were also using single-use plastics to carry that food and living in Mexico, I couldn't do this. So it just it felt like it was a challenge on top of a challenge on top of a challenge. And I was very discouraged by this. I was very discouraged by the fact that I couldn't find any information. And I started researching on Reddit, on Facebook. I was writing on every forum I could find, asking people what they thought I could do to lower my impact during my hike. And I kept coming across the argument that just by being on the trail, I was already reducing my environmental footprint enough because I'm not using a car and I'm not showering and I'm not using electronics and et cetera, et cetera. And to me, even though this is true, to me, it wasn't enough because I just couldn't bear the fact that I would be producing so much plastic throughout my hike. So I broke down what I had to do. First of all, well, by the way, if there's any questions, I can't see them because I'm presenting. So Pam, if you could just interrupt me at any time, if there's any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer. So first I looked at gear. I broke down what I had to do in order to make my hike as waste-free as possible. And um, first I looked at gear. So I saw what I already owned. I looked for what I could borrow. And then if I couldn't, if I didn't own something already and I couldn't borrow it from someone, then I would shop secondhand. And I basically looked in places like REI used gear, eBay and Reddit. Those were the main places where I found my gear and I would contact the sellers. This was harder for REI, but on Reddit and on eBay, I would personally contact the sellers and ask them to ship my, my gear in basically plastic free, just cardboard boxes or uh, reused boxes and no plastic packaging. For REI, this was harder. So I did get some plastic from them, but I, I made an effort every time. This, by doing this, uh, I was supporting a circular economy. This made me save money, which I think we all like to do. And also meant that there was less water, less CO2 emissions and less resource extraction uh, associated with the gear that I was taking with me on the PCT. If I couldn't find something used and I knew that I had to buy something new, then I would look for the most sustainable option. I would look for natural fibers such as this P-Rack that is made of 
bamboo fiber, this backcountry bidet made of uh, cornstarch pellets, or even these uh, dry bags and food bags that are made from scraps, leftover scraps of other bags that these manufacturers developed, or there were older models that were never going to be sold. So I uh, got those. I would also avoid single use plastics. I don't know why, but for some reason on long trails like the PCT, using smart water bottles is kind of like a, a trend. A lot of people uh, use them and I found them on almost every blog post I found about gear lists. The smart water bottles were just like a thing that you carry if you're a through hiker. And I was very nervous because I wasn't finding anything that could uh, substitute this, but not add extra weight because a Nalgene bottle or a stainless steel bottle was too heavy for a through hike. Um, after doing all of this, my final gear list kind of looked like this. So pre-owned or borrowed gear was my beanie, my stove, my headphones, my head net, my bamboo spoon, my sleeping socks, my GoPro, my phone, and my lighter. Most of my gear was either used or bought imperfect or refurbished, like my backpack, even the pack liner, the plastic pack liner that I had inside my bag was used. My tent, my pad, my quilt, sun umbrella, everything, my Garmin was refurbished, dry bags were imperfect, uh, my headlamp was used, my power bank was refurbished, etc. And I had to buy some new things, but I looked for more sustainable options than the competition. So this was my socks, my hat, my base layers, my underwear, my bidet, my pee rag, my water bladder, and my water bottles. And I did have to buy some new items that were just manufactured normally, but this was minimal, like my shoes, my liners, my sun gloves, my rain pants, my water filter, my fuel canister adapter, which did help me um, avoid some waste, which I'm going to tell you about later on. After tackling gear, I looked into toiletries and accessories. So this was the list of toiletries that I took with me on the trail. Usually it would look something like this. So single use plastics and very small containers, which means a lot of waste. And these are things that you have to be buying over and over again on the trail. So I was trying to avoid all of this. So I took a bamboo toothbrush that I couldn't have because I wanted to be ultralight. Um, I found some toothpaste tabs that were, that came in a tin can. I had cornstarch floss, a menstrual cup, a wooden comb, a natural anti-chafe balm in a tin can and a bug balm in a tin can as well. And a little tiger balm in a glass container. And I also pre-cut my, I had a shampoo bar, a face soap bar, and a natural soap bar that I pre-cut in my house before leaving for the trail. And I repackaged in tin foil squares and I left it at my friend's house, the one who helped me with all my food resupplies. And then I would tell him that I needed more shampoo or more soap and he would put it in my boxes for me to use and avoid buying plastics. Uh, so this is the toothpaste tabs that I took. For me, it was important that any toiletries that I had with me were came in zero waste packaging because they are such small items that they're really easy to lose. And I actually did lose my um, sunscreen at one point on the trail. And I wanted to make sure that if I was leaving anything behind on the trail, I wasn't polluting the trail and I wasn't leaving behind plastic. So the fact that I lost this, even though I was sad that I lost my sunscreen stick, I was reassured by the fact that I wasn't polluting the environment because it's made of all natural ingredients and it comes in zero waste packaging. After that came the food. So the food was the biggest challenge of all because this is where the most waste is produced on long hikes. The first thing I did was I researched which towns had grocery stores with a good bulk section. I did this for the whole trail. So I looked at all the resupply points on the PCT. I then made a list of all the points where I wanted to stop at. And then I went into Google Maps and I looked at every single town and I looked for their grocery stores. And then I would click on the stores that I thought 
could have a bulk section. And then I would look through their pictures to see if they did actually have a bulk section. So this took a lot of time. And um, after that, I made a list of all the bulk grocery stores that I had to check out in San Diego before hitting the trail, because this is where I flew into. This is where my friend who helped me with all the resupplies lives. So I looked at which stores could work for me and I made it a plan to check them out before heading to the trail to see if I could get my food there. The next step was to talk to the bulk managers. So because of COVID, a lot of uh, stores that have a very good bulk section were pre-packaging their food in plastic because of their regulations. And at first this was very disheartening because I thought that everything that I had planned was just going to crumble because food was the biggest waste source of all and I wasn't going to be able to manage this. But then I thought about talking to the manager and kindly asking them to bring in my own containers and have them fill my containers for me. So this is what we did. This is my friend who helped me with everything and this is me talking to the manager and seeing what I wanted, check out the prices so that I could make a list, make a list of the things that I would take with me on the trail. Then I would reapportion all the food that I would buy in bulk into resealable home compostable bags. So because I wanted to avoid big containers like tin, um, like metal or glass or even silicone bags that are very convenient, but they're heavier than the traditional plastic silicone ba bags. Um, I was searching for options and I found this brand called Biobag who have um, resealable bags and I contacted them personally to make sure that their um, bags were home compostable because a lot of times things that are labeled compostable will only decompose in industrial compost, which is very hard to find and you have to reach certain temperatures and pH levels that it's, they're very hard. So you have to make sure that they are home compostable. So they assured me that these bags would degrade in your compost in three to six months. So that was perfect for me. And this is what I did with my food. And after that, I would complement my resupplies with vegan bars and dehydrated meals that came in home compostable packaging. I only found two brands of vegan compostable meals, which are these from Way Food. They are based in Oregon and Evergreen Adventure Foods. I'm not sure where they're based, but they're also very good. And I found these bars. They were the only granola bars that I carried for the whole trail and I didn't get tired of them at all. I didn't get tired of the dehydrated meals either because they were so yummy. And these bars are also home compostable and they're also cooked with um, solar power, which I thought was really cool. Then I would make the boxes. I would seal them with paper tape and I would ship them ahead. It was important for me to uh, seal them with paper tape because contrary to uh, what I was finding from other hikers, they usually use like duct tape that has some specific pattern or they use stickers so that it's easy for people at the post office to identify their boxes when they go get them along the trail. So for me, it was important to use paper tape and there were some stickers that the post office would put on there that I couldn't avoid. So after doing all that, I started a crowdfunding campaign for my hike because first of all, because I didn't have enough money to do the trail, but I really, really wanted to do it. So I uh, asked for help from friends and family and I decided that I was gonna donate 26% of all the proceedings to a Mexican environmental NGO called the Mexican Center for Natural Law. What they do is they promote and defend the right to a healthy environment as a fundamental human right, and they protect different ecosystems and endemic species here in Mexico. This was very important for me because I knew that I am a very privileged person just because I am able to go hike the PCT and to go to a country where trail maintenance and uh, resource protection, natural resource protection is a thing and here in Mexico is it's not that much um, sadly so recognizing this privilege I wanted to give back and do what I could to make sure that others in my country had the same opportunities and also 
to make this donation a, a way of mitigating any avoidable impacts that my hike would have. So after I did all this planning, I actually had to go hike the trail. So before I left, I made it my goal not to seek perfection, to stay flexible and stay creative and to remind myself that this was a personal journey. And the reason why I was doing this and why I did it is not because I necessarily wanted to document it or put it out there. It was just the way that I thought my hike made sense for me. And I was literally hiking my own hike and respecting that others were hiking theirs and not trying not to uh, seem like pushy. It was just me doing my own thing. So uh, when I was in towns, this is when I would solve the most waste problems because on trail, I wasn't producing any waste. So in towns, I would have to take care of my compostable bags. So this is what three, work, three weeks worth of food would look like for an average through hiker. And this is what it looked like for me buying bulk. So all these are compostable bags. And this little thing here is a container that I was reusing to fill with peanut butter or almond butter. And I used it the whole trail. So this is what a normal through hiker is left over after a week. And this is what I was left over after a week. They're all compostable, but I did have to make sure that they got composted because I wasn't going to carry them for the entirety of the trail. And I didn't want to throw them into landfill because just because you're buying something that's compostable doesn't mean that it's going to end up in the right place. So I wanted to make sure that it would get composted. So I would look for um, people or places that could compost my bags for me. Usually this meant going into coffee shops and asking if they composted their beans. And if they said yes, then I would tell them about my hike and my mission and ask them if they could take care of my bags for me. And I was very surprised that most of the times they said yes. Some other times they said no, but I did have some occurrences where people would overhear my conversation with the, with the person working at the coffee shop or any other well, uh, store that I went into and they would offer to take my bags for me and take them to their home compost or to their brother's farm and people were usually really helpful so this was a very it really helped me to reduce my waste on the trail then in towns when I knew I had to buy food to eat there I would only buy items that were that came in recyclable containers and I would make sure as much as I could that I got them recycled and they wouldn't end in landfill. I also avoided single use plastic. So when I went grocery shopping, I would always take my food bag with me and I would fill it with anything I got from the grocery store so that they wouldn't give me any bags from there. In some towns I could buy my own bulk resupply. So I did this whenever possible also to avoid the waste associated with shipping boxes all the way from San Diego, especially when I was reaching the states of Oregon and Washington. So I did find some stores along the trail, but not many. And I would also transfer my fuel. So halfway along the trail, when I was in Northern California, I got one of these things, which is a device that allows you to transfer fuel from one fuel canister to another. And that way I was avoiding leaving behind half full um, propane fuel containers and buying new every single time. I would also repair any broken gear that I had. So along the trail, a lot of my sunglasses broke. I started off with a pair of used sunglasses and they broke in the desert. I tried to fix them with tape, but they just wouldn't hold. And when I was in towns, I would look at all the sunglasses that they had in different gear stores. And I was so tempted to get them because mine were just falling apart. But again, I reminded myself of what I could do to lessen my impact and what these glasses were made from and what would happen if I lost them. So I waited as much as I could. And then I got uh, these pair, this pair of recycled sunglasses. So. I made sure that I looked for the most sustainable option if I couldn't repair something that I broke along the trail. 
So basically, I see my hike as a, a following the leave no trace principles, the seven principles, but kind of a reloaded version. So if you don't know the seven principles, first of all, you have to plan ahead to make sure that you have everything you need and you're not, um, for me, that I'm not buying anything uh, that produces waste just because I didn't plan. The second one is you hike and you camp on durable surfaces only, respecting the environment that you're hiking in. The third one is disposing of your waste responsibly. And for me, that meant producing little to no waste. And the fourth one is leaving what you find and also taking what doesn't belong. So uh, along the trail, I was picking up trash that I found that sometimes uh, fell out of other people's bags. So I was picking up that minimizing uh, campfires and respecting wildlife and being considerate of others, but also considerate of nature because we are, as hikers, we are enjoying nature and we are enjoying trails and ecosystems that are giving us so much. So the least we can do is be considerate of that space and the nature we are inhabiting and taking care of it as much as we can and acting responsibly. So yeah, like I said, take care of nature just as much as nature takes care of you. And uh, as Pam was mentioning earlier, being a good steward of the trail, picking up anything that you find there that doesn't belong, even if it's not yours, you are helping it a lot because that can take hundreds of years to degrade and it never fully disappears. And yeah, this is just some of the trash that I would find along the trail. These are all things that are very convenient for us as hikers because they are small, they are uh, single use, they let, us, uh, re they let us divide our food resupplies into portions and it's very convenient to carry and they last a long time in their packaging. But if we lose it on the trail, which does happen because I also lost things. It's gonna have a huge impact. And also it's never gonna disappear. It's just gonna go into landfill. Even if when we go into the trail and we dispose of it, it doesn't disappear. So uh, I consider my through hike, my zero waste through hike a success. It took me five and a half months to reach the Canadian border. And in case you were wondering, my dad joined me for the last three weeks of the trail. And it was a very nice way of uh, giving him what he gave me all those years. And now I'm gonna tell you about the challenges that I faced hiking zero waste on the PCT. So the first one was finding out that there were a lot of towns that didn't compost and didn't even know what composting was. And this meant that I had to carry a lot of my leftover compostable bags on my pack and this meant more weight and more weight and more weight. Luckily, the CEO from Fernway Food, the, the dehydrated meals that I told you about, she contacted me and she sent me to those towns compostable mailers. So I would put in all my leftover bags, I would put them in the compostable mailer and send it back to her and she would compost them for me. So this was huge help and I'm very grateful. Um, the second challenge was cravings and hiker boxes. So as hikers, we get very, very, very hungry. And whenever I would go into a town and I saw a hiker box, I saw so many things that I knew were so yummy. A lot of them were vegan, but they came in plastics and to be completely honest, I wasn't able to uh, fight this craving. So I never purchased anything that came packaged in plastic myself. But if I found something in a hiker box that I really wanted, even though it came in plastic, I would eat it and I would take it with me and I would throw it out. So this was waste that I generated because I just, I was so hungry. And it also became like a forbidden fruit. Like I would go, I would never be able to buy cliff bars or kind bars or any of that fancy stuff. So whenever I saw it in a hiker box, a lot of hikers were already done with those things because they had been eating them so much along the trail. And for me, it was like, oh, 
yay. So this was a thing that was a big challenge for me. Uh, another one was some unavoidable waste like painkillers. There wasn't any way for me to find ibuprofen uh, that wasn't packaged in plastic. And I did need ibuprofen to help with pain associated with hiking such a long trail. So I did buy two bottles of ibuprofen on the trail. I would also go into a town and ask for something uh, for here to avoid takeaway containers, but then they would forget and just bring it to me in plastic. So I did have to dispose of that. And also shoes. I had to buy five pairs of shoes. Before the trail, I wanted to go for this brand that uh, plants one tree for every shoe that you buy etc and it's very environmentally friendly but when I tried them out they just weren't working for my feet so I had to change my setup a few days before leaving the trail and these the brands that I went for are not the most sustainable brands in the market and also I couldn't find any recycling programs for shoes on the trail I did ask in REI once a really close to Lake Tahoe, I asked if they recycled their shoes. I didn't want any money back, but I just wanted to make sure that the shoes weren't ending up in landfill and they said no. So I just left them in hiker boxes, hoping that someone would use them. But honestly, I don't think so because they were so beaten up. Um, and the other challenge was fighting mosquitoes and avoiding toxic chemicals. So when I was in the Sierras, I got a lot of mosquitoes because we got a heat wave and I hadn't told my friend to send me my bug net and my bug balm yet on my boxes and he was out of town so for two weeks I had to deal with mosquitoes and I it was very mentally challenging because people would offer me DEET or I would go into a town along the trail and I would find a natural biodegradable bug spray but it came in plastic so I didn't buy it so I just had to stick through it and deal with the mosquitoes so that was also a big a big challenge um and basically yeah the waste I generated was my flight I had to fly to San Diego I couldn't drive there the border was closed when I when I hiked so even though I did want to cross the border by car I couldn't so I had to fly I used five pairs of shoes that ended up probably going into landfill. I did use a few fuel canisters and when they were empty, I would dispose of them. Some uh, towns did recycle their canisters, but most of them didn't. And recycling a fuel canister is very hard. And it's also very dangerous waste that I didn't know how to avoid because I didn't want to cold soak the whole way. So I did want to. Uh, cooked meals and warm meals, especially in Washington. So this was also waste that I generated. And shipping boxes, even though I used cardboard and I try to make sure that the boxes got recycled when I was done with them, I the stickers and the tape that came on the boxes that the post office would put on them would go to landfill. And also there's carbon emissions associated with shipping the boxes themselves. Painkillers, as I mentioned, and the food packaging from any hiker box food that I wanted. Uh, but I did avoid a lot of waste. So um, a guy named Grayson, he interviewed me a few months ago about my hike. And he posted, um, he made a post on Outside Magazine. And it's basically around him counting every bit of trash for one month during his hike on the PCT last year. And that's how he found about my hike. So he tallied the waste that he created for a month on the through hike. And he figured that he discarded around 20 items every day for the whole month. So I believe that for the five and a half months of trail that I that took me to finish the whole PCT, I avoided around 3000 items of waste from going into landfill more or less. Oh, I just saw a question. The bug balm is from Solterra shop. There you go. Um, yeah, so I believe I avoided around 3,000 items from going into landfills. And 
if you think about roughly 400 through hikers finishing the trail just last year, which I don't even know if there it was more or less. And there's also hikers that didn't finish the trail, but if you just think about 400 through hikers finishing the trail, this means there's um, 1,200,000 pieces of trash going into landfill in a single year on the PCT alone. And this to me is just baffling. So I believe that even though my hike wasn't perfect, I did avoid a lot of waste. And I hope that other people start avoiding as much waste as they can as possible because we all love this scenery that I'm um, showing you right here, the Sierras, the, just any trail, any natural ecosystem in the world. We love it, it gives us so much. And the least we can do is try to be as responsible as we can. And as hikers, we have so much privilege because not everyone in the world is able to quit their jobs and go hike for months and get lost in nature and afford expensive gear. And I don't know, I think we, we have a big job to do. And so I wanted to share a few tips for anyone who is looking to reduce their waste while they're backpacking. The first of all is, first of all is food packaging, as I mentioned. So the largest market for plastics today is packaging materials. And that rubbish now accounts for nearly half of all plastic waste generated globally. And most of it will never get recycled or incinerated. Even if it gets incinerated, there's a lot of chemicals that are going into the atmosphere related to this process. So you can buy in bulk and if possible, you can make your own. If you're going on shorter hikes, you can use pre-owned containers um, like metal or glass so that if it gets lost on the trail, you're not polluting it as much as if you take plastic. And you could also take silicone bags, which are very convenient and a bit more lightweight than metal and glass. For longer hikes, I do advise you to use home compostable bags, making sure that they do compost in a home compost and not industrial composts. But I wouldn't advise you to do this if you're going on a shorter hike. So I would avoid, I avoid compostable plastics generally, but because of the nature of a long trail, I had to use them. So if you're going on a long trail, I do advise you, advise you, advise you sorry, to use them, but for shorter hikes, then carrying a little extra weight won't hurt that much. You can make your own snacks, you can make your own electrolytes and energy gels, and it helps you save money and it also helps the planet. There's a lot of um, recipes out there that you can just Google. And also, if you wanna just hit me up, I can give you a few. You can also support brands that are offering creative solutions and eco-friendly solutions like Fernway Food, Evergreen Adventure Foods, Live Bar, and any other brand that you find that is pushing the industry towards change, usually they're making very, very few money, very little money from doing this, but they're doing it because they know that it's important. So I think if it's in our power to pay a little bit extra for these type of meals, then we should do that because then we're supporting that and we're increasing the demand and hopefully help reduce the price so that other hikers in the future find this more accessible. The second thing I would advise you to do is ditch your toilet paper. So I didn't carry any toilet paper on my hike. I carried a backcountry bidet and a pee rag because making a single roll of toilet paper requires 37 gallons of water, 1.3 kilo hours of electricity and around 1.5 pounds of wood, which commonly comes from unsustainable crops. There's also bleaches and other chemicals that are used in the production of toilet paper and these leach into the soil if you leave them behind. So a leave no trace principle is not to leave your toilet paper buried in the back country, but that means that you have to carry it with you. And to me, that's disgusting. So just use a back country bidet. Honestly, it's the best thing that you could use. It's so much more hygienic. And if you need a pee rug, then use a pee rug. Also rethink your gear. As I mentioned, um, you can use what you have or you can borrow. Most of the waterproof and breathable outwear that we need for long hikes is made from highly toxic compounds and many fabrics for tents and clothing are created from petrochemicals. 
Also the metals for your tent poles, your cooking kits, and your electronic devices are typically taken from the earth in a very unsustainable way. So if we buy used or refurbished or use what we have, we are helping reduce the demand for new materials and more extraction of materials from the earth. And if we're voting with what we buy, we can look for brands that are trying to make a difference and we support them and we push the industry towards change, as I mentioned. So remembering that the most sustainable piece of gear is the gear that already exists and the gear that you already have. You don't, even if there's a brand that is very sustainable, if you don't need it, you don't have to buy it because even if it's sustainable, it does require resources to make and to ship. So use what you own, you borrow, you buy use, or you buy sustainable. Where can you buy used? So if you live in the US, you can look for REI used, you can look at eBay, Reddit, North Face Renewed, uh, Patagonia OneWare, Facebook Marketplace. If you live in Canada, then MEC also has, MEC also has a good used gear section, Requipper. If you live somewhere else in the world, like I do, it's harder. So what I did is I ordered these things online to a friend's house in the US. And then when they came to Mexico, then they gave it to me. Another thing that you can do is transfer your fuel. You can buy these little devices, I think for like 10 or 15 bucks, and they help you reduce a lot of waste and money and change up your toiletries. So every year around 1.5 billion toothpaste tubes are discarded worldwide and around 20 billion pads, tampons and applicators end up in North American landfills alone. So if you go for natural products that come into your waste packaging, you use a menstrual cup and for longer hikes, you pre-cut your own shampoo, your soap and your face soap bars, you are helping reduce this number immensely. And the last thing you can do is give back. So look for a cost that you align with. And if it's in your possibilities to do so, you can donate a percentage of your expenses or volunteer your time. So like the Idaho Trails Association, if you live in Idaho, you can volunteer your time or you can donate so that they help maintain trails and that they keep uh, trails healthy and, and happy and reduce human impact. So I believe that everyone here watching can do it. Just the fact that you're here um, listening to me rant about this. I could talk about this for years. So just listening to me talk about this means that you care. So just recognize the privilege that you have and act from that privilege with responsibility. Uh, make sure that you leave no trace when you hike and that you leave the trail better than you found it. Inspire through example and try to do this with kindness and compassion and not through telling people what to do or nagging them or making them, making them feel like they're not good enough or they don't know enough or that they're doing it wrong. They just don't have the information they need yet. So if you can just share through example and with kindness, I think it creates a bigger impact. Also recognize ourselves as being a part and not a part of nature. This to me is what has helped me um live this way and hike this way i just i feel so connected to nature that i don't see how i can be okay with damaging it even if it's in the long term because when we're using plastics and when we're producing waste maybe we don't see the impact right now and we think that because we're not leaving it on the trail. It's not gonna affect the trail, but it is gonna affect the trail in the long run. So recognizing ourselves as a part of nature is a huge thing that we can do to make it easier for ourselves to make these changes. And also know that you don't have to apply all these changes at once and you shouldn't strive to be perfect. Just doing one thing one day and then doing another thing the next day is going to add up and it's a domino effect that will take you to hopefully living a more zero waste lifestyle, especially when you're enjoying nature. And I wanted to share this phrase by Amber Allen, another woman who is very inspiring. She uh, 
well, I'm just going to share this quote. She says, being perfectly vegan, being perfectly zero waste, being perfectly plastic free, because small conscious changes are better than none at all. So don't worry if you don't nail it on the first try or even on your first month or your first year of trying to make these changes. We all, I've been there, so don't just be kind with yourself as well as with others. And there's usually always a solution. You just have to be fun, have fun, sorry, and be creative and along the trail. I would want to buy some fruit that I found um, by a, a highway, but they would only offer fruit in plastic containers. So I figured out a way that they could give me fruit in my own pot or my ice cream or some uh, cold beverages or even smoothies that usually they gave them out in plastic uh, cups with a plastic straw. I kindly told them about my mission and I asked them if they could put it in my own container. And if they said no, then I would just say thank you and leave because we don't always need what we, what we crave. And you can also apply changes off the trail. This is just an example of me in Mexico City wanting to buy spicy peanuts and not forgetting my reusable bags and containers and everything that I usually carry with me. I do forget it sometimes because I'm human. So I took an envelope from the bank that I had just gone to and I put my peanuts there. And um, yeah, I just wanna say thank you to the Idaho Trails Association for opening up this space. And to any of you interested in contacting me, I am very happy to help in any way that I can. If you have any questions or you wanna reduce your impact on the trail or in your everyday life. I am happy to help and I'm open to any questions. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I really want to have an in-depth conversation with you about the backcountry bidet, but I don't know if we should do that here. So <laughs> I don't mind. If other people don't mind, I am I am open to talking about this. I actually bought one and I'm terrified of it because I'm like, how am I going to do this? without things going bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, there's a learning curve for sure. Yeah. But once you nail it, it's much better than using. I mean, if you think about it, if you, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm going to talk about poop now, but if you, if you get like poop on your, a part of your body, then you're going to, you're not going to clean it with just like a napkin and then go like, go live your day. Normally you're going to put water on it at least. So if you think about the same thing for your butt, then it's much cleaner to use a backcountry bidet. You just have to get the angle right. That's the only thing and practice. Yeah, practice. That's a good tip. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if anybody has any question, now's the time. Along the way, there were some questions about the products that you used and mm -hmm. the, the different meals and bars. And I tried to find... Um, links for those and put them up in the chat. But if I miss anything, um, anyone's on and has any more questions about those, please put them up. Um, yeah, I had a question about the bio bag. So I was looking at those and I don't know how long, what was the longest that you had something in a bio bag? Cause I guess I'm thinking about like when you resupplied, you know, or got yourself ready to resupply with boxes. Like if you got something that had been in a bio bag for three months, was it just like, great or do they hold up pretty good it, it did hold up pretty good I did have some so the first batch of food that I bought in San Diego with my friend it was really big because I sent a few boxes in advance before I left for the trail and there was also some leftover and I think some of the food was in the bags for maybe I don't know a month and it was it was pretty okay like it wasn't it didn't taste like fresh but yeah. it wasn't stale at all. It was it was pretty good. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we have a question about what shampoo did you use? I use a shampoo that I buy close to my house in Mexico City. But there's a lot of different brands that are making solid shampoos now. So it's just a matter of finding the one that works best for you. I've tried different ones and I've tried different brands and some of them work, some of them don't. And I just found the one that I liked, so I bought one in Mexico and then I cut it up and I took it with me to, to the US. Uh, I see another question. Why did you choose 26% to give to chosen organization? Yes, I chose 26% because the 
trail is roughly 2,600 miles. So it was 1% for every 100 miles that I hiked. So that's why I chose that amount. And also I was 26 years old when I hiked it. So there you go. Lots of significance. Yeah. Uh, was there any reason why you didn't cook or dry your own food? Yes, because I don't live in the U.S., so I couldn't travel on the plane with my own food. And that's basically why. And also, I haven't found a way. I know that people that dehydrate their own meals, they have to use like they seal them in a vacuum, but that needs plastic. So I haven't found any materials that you can use to vacuum seal your food that is not plastic. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, well, that was really great. I mean, I was actually chatting off land with some like, it's really challenging to like, for lack of a better term, to try and do the right thing. Like, mm. it's so convenient to just like, grab some bars and shove everything yeah. in the Ziploc and get a bunch of freeze-dried meal. They come in their own individual little pack. Like yeah. you really have to try yeah. to do the right thing. So not only like, were you battling with just like <clears throat> the mental part of hiking day after day for five and a half months, but then this like whole other level <laughs> of being really conscious. And that's hard to do. Like when you're already mentally exhausted, from just getting through your day of a hike and then having to like try and make good, good choices on top of that. Like kudos to you for that. That's like the mental strength of an Olympian right there. <laughs> Thank you. I do get asked that a lot. And uh, for me, I think maybe because I had been living that way for a few years before the trail, I'm just used to that. So I'm used to like double checking that my food is not going to come in disposable containers or takeaway containers or just I'm just used to doing that and I'm used to also dealing with frustration when you go somewhere and you go to the grocery store and you see I don't know some cookies that you really want to buy but they're all in plastic so you you don't buy them yeah and you realize that as I said a lot of times what you crave you, you don't really need it so as you said, something that's really convenient for us is not convenient for the planet. And that's something that I just like to remind myself whenever I'm faced with those types of decisions where, or where I'm frustrated and I'm like, oh, I really wanna get this, but it comes in plastic. And I'm like, oh, but it's only one and I'm only one person, so it, <laughs> it shouldn't matter. But then I think about the 7 billion people in the planet and I'm like, okay, so. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it does feel like in my individual actions don't matter, especially when I read the news and I see what's going on. Uh, but then things like this happen. Like I get to talk to around 30 people that are interested in listening to what I have to say, and hopefully it's going to inspire them to make small changes. And then it starts a global movement. So that's that makes it all worth it, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And you bring up a really good point about like, just making it part of your day to day. It's not necessarily about just reducing your waste in nature, but just yeah. your every day yeah. and, and not being perfect and doing little things. Um, it all, you know, I'm definitely a believer in the butterfly flex effect. Yeah. You make one little change and that's that much waste that forever you're never going to be putting out there. So that's yeah. Really and I also think that if you, for me, it's not a matter of it's an extra chore that I have to do, or it's harder that I, that I did the trail this way. It's more of a change in paradigm. So if we, I think humans were used to seeing ourselves as something that is separate from nature and that nature is there to serve us like animals and nature is there to serve us and to give us entertainment or resources or whatever. And if we, change that way of thinking and we see ourselves we recognize ourselves as the interconnected system that we are and that every action that we do will impact in whatever way is going to impact nature and also nature is going to impact us so if we treat it the way that we are treated by nature then i think it becomes easier to make these changes sure yeah yeah, I do see a couple more questions here. So someone's asking about um, 
if you received any pushback from any hiker who was following the more traditional approaches? Uh, some, honestly, not much. I did receive some comments saying like, oh, you're already like adding uh, more logistics into something that's already very challenging, both physically and mentally. Um, I did have some people that met me on the trail some people were really excited because kind of the word spread. So people were like, oh, you're the girl that's hiking with your waist. And I was like, yeah, that's me. Uh, and they had a lot of questions for me, which I was really happy to answer. Great. And yeah. Some people were really, which is valid. They were really um, um, doubtful about how well I was doing it and asking me like, oh, but your filter is made of plastic. And I'm like, well, yes, but there's no filters like I don't want to get Giardia and there's no yeah. filters that are not made with plastic. So you just have to do as best as you can. But the response that I got was mostly positive, overwhelmingly positive, actually. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you're kind of like a, you're kind of like a, a roving message, right? Like everyone that you came across, that was an opportunity to yeah. inspire and educate. Exactly. Um, so uh, another question, were most of your hot meals from the two prepackaged food companies and the bulk was mostly cold soak or raw? Yes. Yeah, so the my hot meals were all of them were from those uh, companies that I mentioned. I didn't get tired them, of them at all. They're really, really good. And actually other hikers that were in my tramley or that I met along the trail that didn't know these brands they saw me eat them and every night they'd be like, oh, what are you making tonight? Like, which one's this one? And I would give them some and they actually ended up buying some for themselves for the trail. And the bulk was mostly raw or cold soaked. So it was basically uh, couscous that I would cold soak, oats that I would cold soak with chia seeds. I had some nuts, some dehydrated fruits, uh, pretzels, stuff like that. So I would only cook Sometimes I would cook the oatmeal when I was really cold, but I would basically only make hot tea and cook um, those prepackaged meals. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is there a volunteer trail group in Mexico you work with or know about? So I don't know about any trail groups in Mexico. There, There's a lot of... Uh, organizations in Mexico that you can volunteer with and they work with um, reforestation and environmental protection and protection of endemic species but because I might be wrong but because in Mexico we don't have the same systems that they have in the U.S. like uh, Pacific Crest Trail Association and Idaho Trails Association like associations that deal with certain um, natural areas of their different states there's not a volunteer program for managing trails because there, there's not any like official and maintained trails in Mexico. You just know the trails and you just go hike the trails. There's no, there's no like, uh, I don't know, gut hook for trails in Mexico. You just, you just hike your trails and you, I use Gaia as well. And I just record them in Gaia. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, and I'm also seeing lots of, you know, um, expressions of thanks and gratitude in the comments, obviously oh. really inspiring for all of us. And yeah, inspiring just to start small and do what we can to kind of lessen our impact while we're out there. Um, yeah, maybe we'll circle back around with you and make sure we get links to all these different things that you've mentioned, yeah. put it in a follow-up or email or something. Cause yeah, like you said, like just scouring the internet for information can be such a time suck. So at least to have some, yeah. You just yeah. Have and I want to, I was very uh, discouraged that I didn't find any information because I know there's a lot of people that have these uh, worries and want to hike with less waste. And uh, it took me a, a lot of hours to do this research, but the, the point of doing this was to be able to share with others that want to do the trail in the future and hopefully they do it better than me. So yeah, I'm happy to share anything. Awesome. Well, with that, we will say um, thank you again. And um, hopefully everyone who's on Instagram will go out and find her and follow on her journey and keep learning how we can reduce our waste on the trail. And um, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, 
I'm sure they can contact her or or just email ITA in general. Yeah. And um, with that, I will say uh, have a great rest of your evening. See you. Thank you.